Hey guys, what is going on? My name is Tim Petey and welcome to yet another book review, or should I say, books review. Today we're going to be looking at the Thrawn duology, the last major story arc before the Yuzhong Vong War. But is this series as masterful as the old Grand Admiral's tactics, or as energetic as his corpse? Let's find out. Lower the gates! I don't think I need to explain to you guys where I'm coming from in this review. If you're watching this, you know I'm a massive Star Wars fan, and that I have read basically all the books that there are out there. So suffice to say, I know what's going on. I know all the characters in and out, and I know the past, the present, and the future of the events of these novels. Which is pretty important considering I'm reviewing them. So if what I say makes no sense out of context, I apologize. I'll try to spell things out so that you guys can understand what I'm talking about without having to have read all the books that I've read. Anyway, as with all of my reviews, let's get over the early parts of the story first. To go along with my usual style of only telling half of the story, I'm going to cover most of the plot of the first book, Spectre of the Past. We start off with Admiral Paleon on a Star Destroyer, his personal ship, the Chimera. He's trying out a new device called the Predictor, which should be able to predict enemy tactics. However, the test goes terribly poorly, and the Admiral is cemented in his decision to ask the Moffs to sue for peace with the New Republic. After Paleon convinces the Moffs to offer peace, he leaves on a trip around the Empire to convince high-ranking officers that this must happen. However, nothing really comes out of this, and it just serves to keep Paleon busy for about a month's worth of the plot. Meanwhile, the Moff of the Imperial capital of Bastion, Moff Dizra, finds out that his aide, Major Tierce, was a royal guardsman for Emperor Palpatine. He brings him into a plot to reinvigorate the Empire as the tactical planner of the group. The third member of the group is named Flim, a con artist whom Dizra has hired to play the role of Grand Admiral Thrawn. Apparently he has somehow survived the Battle of Bill Briggy ten years earlier. Tierce manages to convince four Star Destroyer captains of Thrawn's legitimacy, one of them is dispatched to follow a Corellian corvette dispatched by Paleon to send General Bell Iblis a message asking for a peace rendezvous. The other three are ordered to attach to a comet outside the Bothawi system, which is supposed to pass close to the planet in approximately a month and a half. Now we finally meet up with our New Republic heroes. Han and Chewie, along with Luke, go to mediate a dispute between the Diamala and Ishori races. Han reveals he asked Luke to come because he left Leia on Wayland to relax while he handles the dispute himself. However, soon after negotiations begin, a pirate attack occurs, and Luke sends his clones crewing the pirate vessels. We go back to Leia on Wayland with the Nogri, where a scavenger is found. He tries to escape with data cards from the Emperor's personal files, but is caught by Talon Card as he arrives to do some deals with the Nogri. The importance of this scene is to reveal two data cards that were apparently in the Emperor's personal files. The first one of the two cards talks about the destruction of the planet Kamas at the end of the Clone Wars. Apparently, the planet was destroyed thanks to a group of Bothans who sabotaged the planetary shields. The second data card is labeled the Hand of Thrawn, although it is too damaged to access. Many speculate that this is either a super weapon or an agent like Mara Jade, who used to be the Emperor's Hand. Cut back to Luke, who is infiltrating a pirate base in an attempt to follow up on sensing clones during the attack. He manages to sneak into the base, but he is discovered and trapped in what actually turns out to be a pretty decent Jedi trap, which involves shifting gravity, metal rods shooting out of the walls, and gas. He still manages to escape, however, and Mara Jade arrives with the Starry Ice, one of Talon Card's ships. She manages to get Luke off the asteroid, though while they are leaving they briefly spot an alien ship with some design similarities to the TIE Fighter. It escapes before they can learn much, and Mara takes Luke to a New Republic medical facility where his wounds can be cared for. Meanwhile, Han and Leia travel to Bothawi to try to find Bothan financial records. However, while they're there, an Imperial intelligence team using an invisible blaster and a redirection device make it look as if Han fires into a crowd gathered outside the building. A massive riot ensues, but luckily Han and Leia escape unharmed, though 3PO is vaporized Ugnaught style. Don't worry, the story summary is almost done. Mara, Corrin Horn, and Talon Card are all aboard the Errant Venture when another alien ship shows up. 
It sends a message in an unknown language that mentions Thrawn's full name, which I definitely won't try to pronounce since I'm pretty sure it would just make me look like an idiot. Mara calculates the intersection of the two ship's hyperspace jumps and goes to the system. She lands on a planet she detects activity on, but is knocked out by an unknown assailant when she enters the cave. Luke runs into Card shortly after and decides to try and find her, since it's been a week since she was last in contact with them. The final scene of the book takes place with Paleon waiting at the rendezvous for Iblis. A group of ships jump in, and they are colored in the livery of the Corellian Defense Force, made to look like Bel Iblis sent them. However, Dizra is the one who ordered them there, and he's trying to convince the Admiral to not go through with the peace talks. However, Admiral Paleon actually uses one of Iblis's tactics against the ships and succeeds far more than he should have against the man himself. Paleon knows that this is a ruse and decides to wait a little longer for Iblis, but then leave the system to get answers. And now that we're done with the story summary, we can move on to character analyzation. The character that I would say changes the most in this duology is Luke, though it's not a direct thing that just happens immediately. He talks in the beginning about how he has been trying to use his powers less, and his time with Mara helps him realize how the dark side has had a hold on him since the Emperor Reborn incident. Though Mara's discussion with him about this really doesn't make any sense. He also happens to have one of the craziest climaxes at the end of Vision of the Future, which has huge consequences for the galaxy and himself, especially during the Yuzhong Vong War and the Legacy of the Force series. The only problem with Luke's character is that every time he undergoes a big psychological change in any of the books, it seems to be the same change he underwent last time, figuratively speaking. Luke is always having this big revelation about how to be a good person, despite going through this kind of climax in almost every story he's in. Shadows of Mindor, Truce of Bakura, the original Tron trilogy, and many more. He always seems to realize, Oh my god, I've been messing up the whole time! It makes it painfully obvious that most writers only seem capable of having Luke go from idiot Jedi farm boy to wise Jedi master in a single story arc. Anyway, enough about Luke. On to another important character, Paleon. I have always liked Paleon in everything he's been in, and this duology is no exception. As Supreme Commander of the Imperial Military, he basically runs the Empire along with the Moff Council. However, he is the only one who has the forthright to see that they must make peace with the New Republic. If the New Republic has a chance to resolve its internal squabbles, they will focus on the Empire and ground it to dust. Especially in the second book, Paleon gets so much done, it's amazing to see. Just trust me when I say, and I don't want to spoil anything specific, Paleon is not going to sit idly by while Dizra, Flim, and Tyrs do what they will with his empire. The final character I would like to cover in detail is Talon Card. This book is one of the very few opportunities we have to learn about Card's past. His quest throughout the two books is to find the man he took over this organization from, George Cardas. Card is terrified of the man, which is something we have not seen from Card up to this point. Usually he's calm, collected, and always willing to make a deal, especially if it involves information. Now though, Card is always scared that everyone he encounters on this journey is working for Cardos, and that Cardos has something terrible planned for Card and his crew. As I've mentioned, I won't spoil the ending. Suffice to say, Card's meeting with Cardos does not go how anyone would have expected. Unfortunately, there are a plethora of characters that I don't have the time to talk about here. Mara, Dizra, Tierce, Han, Leia, Lando, and more. There's so many characters here who I just cannot talk about. However, Mara's the only one who really undergoes any giant changes, and those all relate to Luke, so I covered most of them in my Luke discussion. However, there are a number of other characters that are even more minor that you still get interested in, which is great. There are also a lot of storylines, so I want to lay out what the storylines are. Mara and Luke are on Niruan. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Leia, Han, and Lando are all searching for the Kamas document. The Empire is trying to defeat the New Republic, and Paleon is trying to sue for peace. All of this along with Talon Card trying to find George Cardas the whole time. There are really a ton of storylines to follow, and including some other minor ones from the minor characters, you will have plenty to keep you interested. As usual, Timothy Zahn does a great job bringing all these storylines together in an awesome climax. Eventually, everything comes together in a pretty surprising conclusion, driven with shocks, explosions, and death. One thing that does surprise me about this series is how much Thrawn factored in, despite being dead for 10 whole years before this takes place. 
Everything the man did had layers upon layers, and even the threat of him returning a la Flim and Dizra, is enough to drive everyone into a panic and no longer trust anything going on around them. With Thrawn involved, nothing was how it seemed, and this extends ten years after his death. Some of the things that happened, especially involving Luke and Mara, reveal just how much Thrawn was involved in everything, and what kind of legacy he has left behind. Well, it's that sad time again. Do I recommend these books? The answer is a very enthusiastic, absolutely. Timothy Zahn once again proves his mastery of the Star Wars material, and especially this kind of Thrawn-related writing in particular with this duology. I would definitely recommend giving them a read, especially the second book. They both keep you riveted, and you will not want to put these down. You will be drawn into these stories and have a great time. The second book is probably the single thickest paperback out of all of the Star Wars books, just because of the sheer number of things that happens in it. Anyway guys, I hope you enjoyed this review. I'm going to sign off for now, and before I get sucked into anything else, my name is Timpedia, and I will catch you guys next time.